depths of my own sexuality had excited me since the long recesses at Mrs. Tucker's Montessori school. Selfish needs of wanting to be desired by my peers, girls and boys alike, led to games of chasing the other children around, trying to kiss them. If I sought out desire in preschool, this need only intensified during elementary school. I was bullied, often and cruelly, which only increased my need to be liked and accepted. I was teased for the things I said, the clothes I wore, the games I liked to play, my hair, the way I mixed up words when I read, and anything else that seemed odd to the rest of the girls. Their cruelness stayed at me throughout the rest of my life, but I never felt that I was wrong. I continued to wear, say, and do weird things. However, there was one experience that raised lasting insecurities. From the second to fourth grade, I carpooled with a classmate. We saw a lot of each other. My mother dropped me at her house in the mornings before school. I waited in the living room as both she and her mother got ready for the day. One morning, my friend said, I'm going to change my clothes. Don't watch me through the crack in my wall. I hadn't even known there was a crack in her wall. <laughs> I sat on that couch every morning watching TV and never noticed it. But there it was, a split in the wall a quarter inch wide. Could I really see anything through it? I absolutely had to peek. I saw her standing, still wearing her pajamas, staring at me from the other side of the crack. <laughs> Once we got to school, it took five minutes for the news of this event to spread. Girls pretended to be uncomfortable around me because now I was gay and gross. I was teased throughout the day, but then I was teased most days. The difference here was that I felt guilty. Even though my friend had specifically told me not to look, I had looked. When my mother arrived to take us home, my friend was still angry. I didn't have the words to apologize in a way that would make her understand. Um, and this, we had comics interspersed throughout our neighbor narrative. So. As a child, I spent a lot of time alone in my own head. This continued a long time. Sometimes, even when I'm not, I still feel alone. In the house where I grew up, there was a room full of dress-up clothes. It had an ugly brown carpet and lacy curtains, and there were trunks lining the wall bursting with old dresses, suits, silk scarves, and hats. This is where my brother and I spent most of our childhood and where I learned the art of drag. There are pictures of us with grave expressions on our faces, dressed as two waitresses. Medieval serfs and peasants were a source of endless inspiration. There was a blue shirt with gold buttons that could belong to a policeman or sailor, depending on our mood. My brother was the guinea pig for all of my experiments regarding which clothes made women and which made men. I once dressed him as little Bo Peep and made him sit behind our lemonade stand while I hid behind a tree and tallied up the number of customers who thought he was a girl. I remember thinking that it was scary how seriously everyone else seemed to feel about the game of dress up. I saw the grown-ups shaking their heads and chuckling nervously. I knew we only got away with it because we were kids. My first time in a relationship type thing with a girl, it's me and her, it was fun. Tell it wasn't. Liza, we need to talk. <laughs> My affairs with cisgender men were always the easiest to navigate. While they were not healthy or free of manipulation, I at least had a road map for them. There is a simple narrative to follow. It was not just about flirting. When I felt attracted, I knew what to say and how to assess his actions. There is no mystery or fear that I was acting inappropriately. The culture of heteronormativity contributes to this ease. Disappointment and rejection are part of the experience, but not unexpected. Heterosexual stories of attraction, romance, and rejection are pervasively privileged by media and mainstream recounted histories. Women are more intimidating. There is a fear of homophobia inside me, guilt. I do not have a narrative to follow except shame. After breaking up with my high school boyfriend, I started to explore the idea of intimacy with a woman, first alone, then with porn, then in dark corners at bars. Beginning love with a woman shakes my core. Beyond the adrenaline of having a new partner, a new sex, it feels like I'm confronted with that childhood fear and guilt. Mm -hmm. As a queer woman, I feel my gayness is under constant attack. Worse, and possibly only challenger, is myself. I feel guilty if I'm attracted to a man because I'm implicit in the heteronormative narrative, and I'm afraid to initiate partnership with a woman because I'm worried she will think I'm too straight. I used to think my queerness would erase the binary, but instead it can intensify it, stunting my romantic attempts. In high school science class, we learned about solids, liquids, and gases. To demonstrate just how slight the difference can be, we mixed water with cornstarch, making a messy white glob on each of our desks and poking at it. 
Something bizarre happened. If you put pressure on the blob and squeezed it in your hand, it compressed into a solid shape. Then, as soon as you released your force upon it, it melted, oozing through your fingers and dripping back onto the desk. I was mesmerized. The teacher's voice became muted in the background as she moved on to explain the mathematical formula behind this, but I could not stop clenching and unclenching my fist around the blob, watching it take shape and then dissolve. I knew how it felt to be able to hold shape like that, to pose when squeezed, then to melt away formless when given the chance. The youth of today may tend to be more fluid in their identities and resistant to labels and boxes. Therefore, it's important that education includes discussion that were previously reserved only for gay kids or only for straight kids, assumptions that a certain type of anatomy goes with a certain type of sex can be inaccurate and dangerous. Many teenagers now have multiple partners, multiple genders, and a variety of sexual orientations. Sex ed needs to be about managing more than just the mechanics. This means more focus on discussing relationships, emotions, and confusion. The mechanics that are taught, however, need to be learned by everyone. My relationship, uh, my first relationship started when I was 14. Alex was a curly-haired skateboarder and it fell hard. Our connectedness was extreme. My identity was completely consumed by Alex. One plus one equaled one. I held my breath and my tongue, worried that I would exhale and he would be gone. Unfortunately, this worry was unfounded. Alex never left. Even though he ended the relationship over a decade ago, his residue lingers. He took advantage of my desire to be loved. There were many conditions I had to meet to earn his love. One was being able to accept that my jealousy drove Alex to flirt with our classmates and my friends. I also had to believe his lies. He lied about everything just to hear the words. Just as I accepted my grade school friends teasing, I accepted Alex's abuse for those infrequent moments of acknowledgement. He awakened my sexual appetite, but my sexuality was only a tool to unlock his. The only question Alex asked me was, does this hurt too much? He never asked, does this feel good? I wasted a year of my life trying to please him. I never felt safe. After Alex broke up with me, I spent most of my time wasted in mosh pits, surrounded by the best friends I'll ever have. Beer and liquor were everywhere. Even with my support network, I often felt, uh, found myself drunk and crying at the end of the night, replaying memories from my relationship with Alex. My new partner at the time, Casey, cared for me, cleaned up after me, and listened to my broken-hearted teenage poetry. Despite Casey's innocent love, I was consumed by memories of Alex and my broken trust. My sister has a name for the feeling of a doomed relationship. It's called breakup belly. It's a deep feeling that something's nauseatingly wrong. It sits heavy and cold in your stomach, like fried dough eaten in a moment of blind excitement at the fair. You ate the funnel cake, which was delicious and hot and greasy. The sugar powdered your chin and nose. Then you jumped on the roller coaster and put up your arms and screamed, Woo! The lights were dazzling and everything was spinning. And then the ride slowly came to a halt and you just did not feel so good anymore. When it comes to making decisions in relationships, sometimes the belly is a better indicator than even the purest logic. All the sound reasoning in the world cannot hold a candle to trusting your gut. It is obvious that it's hard to say goodbye to a good thing, but it can be surprising when saying goodbye to a bad thing is hard too. Strange that the things that hurt the most are the toughest to let go. They give us easy comfort, but not long-term love. They are interesting, they are compelling. They afford a look into the fabric of darkness, which is worth understanding. But ultimately, they have nothing to give back. And now we're gonna read some of the comics that were submitted by other people to this book. The meat of the book. <laughs> the meat of the loaf. <laughs> I understood some of the clinical aspects of sexual intercourse. It kind of made sense in theory. There are some holes in what I knew though, some gaps and omissions. I was too embarrassed to ask. The magazines in my father's closet helped me to some degree, gals. Still, what was this thing called masturbation? I sifted through drawers, looked under the bed, I probed delicately for clues, like a sleuth in a murder mystery. I 
found objects in which I felt a passing interest, but ultimately proved to be kind of lame. Record of pink cardboard, gals, bonus flexi disc, lady lovelace speaks. See me in gals for more hot action. <laughs> Sex education was a new thing in school, which I found to be dry and tedious. The film strips I saw were a virtual yawn fest and made no mention of the elusive M word. The internet didn't exist yet, but cable television hit the airwaves right around that time. I recall watching a late night comedy, a burlesque show. Buxom ladies were dancing and stripping to the tune of raunchy big band jazz. They vamped and flashed their legs with a grinning enthusiasm. I felt inspired by those sultry ladies, <laughs> how they laughed and moved. <laughs> inspired enough to, well... Uh -oh. Intuitively, and without thinking about it much, I began to dress up in my mother's and sister's clothes. I stuffed my bra with toilet paper. My favorite top was red velvet, tight shorts of green satin, and pantyhose. I would stage performances of a sort, not exactly stripping, but moving around suggestively. I would do this while looking into a full-length mirror. I felt a curious division for myself. Seeing my body in the mirror was like viewing a woman's form. I became the director in my own pornographic feature. Move a limb here, show a leg there, cover this, reveal that. I felt engulfed in an imaginary mind movie, in a rush of color and imagery. I was dumbfounded by how pretty I looked while keeping my face hidden. It really did feel like I was viewing a woman's form that would move as I wished her to. Which was all leading up to something, and one afternoon, things fell into place. Masturbation. The M word. All of those half-remembered schoolhouse jokes and references finally began to make sense. <laughs> I recall those afternoons, how I would walk quickly home from school. I had an hour or two of solitude before my mom or my sister returned. It was showtime. And this next one's called Gray Sex. I admit, no. You can't be. It's flattering. You look good. Sexy. People think I am younger than I am. My friend says, queers don't age. I repeated this to a lover. Queers don't age. <laughs> Whatever, bonus, we also get to have queer sex. Which begs the question, why do I give a damn about how young I look when I could be time spending time enjoying hot sex? <laughs> After all, I should know better. Hi, Pearl. Hi, cutie. I work in geriatrics. Let's get ready for a bath. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Doing good. Little pivot. <laughs> Alrighty, ready? Okay. <laughs> First, you take off your clothes. No, no, I won't get too wet. Aww. I thought this was going to be a sexy thing. <laughs> My polite professional reply, notwithstanding. Uh, nope, just a shower. <laughs> Can you really blame her for asking? Research says that sexual interest and ability does not decline with old age. Why do you keep talking about sex, Mabel? And that different expressions of sexuality are still important, even at the end of life. Because it's the natural thing to do. 
In fact, denying one's sexuality in old age can have negative impact on physical, social, and emotional well-being. In other words, <laughs> make you sick, nutty, and lonely. <laughs> Yet, there are so many barriers to sexual expression for elders. Like my arthritis. <laughs> Health problems, real or perceived. He's going to keel over with a heart attack if he doesn't quit that frisky business. <laughs> Institutional policies, Mrs. Jones, let's keep your door open. At many levels, you're 65, you no longer need an HIV test. From the CDC, screening for HIV infection should be performed for all patients aged 13 to 64 years. And of course, ageism. Mr. Ruiz continues with sexual outbursts, impaired impulse control. We should increase his psych meds among healthcare providers. Ew, I don't even want to think about that. Dirty old men, society at large. Ain't nobody want to jump this whole bag of bones. <laughs> Not actually true. And the internalized variety. Mm -hmm. What if we check the ageism at the door? Sexy. Give me 30 years, then you'll really see sexy. Okay. <laughs> Gotta go, I have a hot date. <laughs> this is called Nude Beach. When I was a kid, my two moms and I spent every summer at the beach. It was a nude beach, not the kind where people go to show off their buns of bronze, but the New England kind with real bodies and old people and lots of families. <laughs> Even though I didn't have a dad, I became well informed about the male genitalia. <laughs> Having spent my formative years at the eye level, so much of it. <laughs> when I was two, a woman, a woman one beach blanket over approached my mom. She had a daughter my age and wanted to borrow a diaper. Our families became beach buddies and then close friends. Have you ever gotten to know someone naked, then run into them wearing clothing? <laughs> you really notice how strange clothing is. <laughs> Jessie's mom took us on a walk down the beach. Jessie was quiet, then asked, I know where babies come from, but how do they get in your belly? Jessie's mom panicked. She knew it would be inappropriate to give her daughter a sex ed lesson in front of me. What if my mother didn't approve of her answer? But before she an could answer, I interrupted with my own creation story. With great authority, I said, well, first the mommies go to the sperm bank, they pick out the sperm they want, and they take it home. At home, they take the sperm and put it inside the mommy, and the sperm makes the baby in the mommy's belly. I, I elaborated for 10 minutes on the sperm bank. <laughs> Jessie was bewildered, her mom was relieved. I didn't know that I would be asked to answer this question about my family for, the, for my entire life, or that I would often be received with the bewilderment of a four-year-old. I was content. I was content, walking the nude beach, having successfully completed my first sex ed lesson. Holes, home base, the Bible. My first serious sexual relationship spawned the realization that our society lacks decent sex ed. A huge factor in this personal story is that my first boyfriend was raised a born again Christian. This influenced a lot of our sexual relations. So imagine my reaction when he revealed to me that females only have one hole to perform our many bodily functions. <laughs> Just think about having to pee out of our vaginas. A forever flow of piss. My body, myself. I'm 5'2", stocky, boyish, 26, punk. And being punk has taught me a lot of things about body image. That I should just be me, that I don't have to shave my legs or wear makeup, that I can be beautiful if I believe I am. But that doesn't mean I'm never insecure. Recently, I joined a gym, but I'm scared to go work out in front of their giant plate glass windows. My friend John said, don't worry, the frat boys aren't looking at you. And even though I didn't want to be object objectified, it still really hurt my feelings. The way you're built, you seem so sturdy. <laughs> Or when a boy I was started kissing called me sturdy. I should have been flattered to be called strong, but part of me wished he said, so pretty or so beautiful. Mm. There's a part of me after all this time that wants to be seen as feminine. 
but at the same time, I don't like wearing dresses or perfumes or other traditionally feminine indicators. So how can I get society at large to recognize all of the gorgeous woman parts of me when I can't bear to present as anything but a scruffy punk in clothes from the boys' department? I guess I'm just waiting for society to accept that gender is not a binary, and I have to learn to accept it too. That I can be pretty, sturdy, girly, scruffy, voluptuous, tough, handsome, beautiful, a woman, a boy, both, or none of the above. Only then will I be happy. Wow, cool, a scarf, thank you. Now open your gift. Can't wait, what is it? A kimono, a kimono. I thought, wait, I'm Filipina, does he know that? Did we have say, <laughs> some sort of inside joke about kimonos? Are you fucking serious? Some sort of China doll, a pretty toy? It doesn't mean anything by it, it's a gift, it's a gift. What if he doesn't like me, I mean, me. I can't say no, should I, what should I do? Pick an accent? I can't read too hard into it. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. How sweet, how sweet of you, it's so nice. Um, I, part of the big point of showing this comic is the juxtaposition of the art with the internal monologue art. Uh, I'll just laugh about it. Maybe that's the cool thing to do. Shit, shit. <laughs> Ouch, if only so. Are you going to try it on? I had my first appointment with a gynecologist when I was 18. He was an attractive young doctor, and the desk in his office was a framed picture of his family. I was really nervous, pre pretending not to be. I told Dr. Plant that I was in my first real relationship and I wanted to go on birth control. In the examination room, Dr. Plant told me I had put my robe on backwards. Sorry, I said I've never done this before. During the breast exam, Dr. Plant asked about the scar on my stomach. I was born with gastrostenitis, I told him. My intestines were on the outside first, and they had to sew them back in. He told me I had a pregnant patient with a child with the same defect. He asked if I'd leave my contact information in case the mother had any questions. He began the exam. It was painful. While I got dressed, Dr. Plant stayed in the room with me. He asked how long I'd been with my boyfriend and reminded me again to leave my contact information. I left my email address with this receptionist. Back in my dorm room, I had two new emails. They were both from Dr. Plant. And she moves on to realize it had been kind of not an improper interaction, and then goes online, does research, and um, talks to other people about her bad experience with the provider. Not that all experiences with providers are bad. But what do I look like inside? My trans parts, I mean. The organs that, I ha that have changed or shut down since hormones. Ain't no biology textbook with me in it. So what do I look at? Where am I explained? How do I communicate my body without words for it? We can start by taking a look at the parts of ourselves we feel have been misnamed, or lack a name, and name them ourselves. Body parts with no name tend to get silenced. Let your body speak for itself. Small boobs. As a fat kid, I was born with boobs. Everyone thought I would grow into them and take after my mother. In middle school, they were the same size as they had been since I was two years old. I didn't think I'd be an adult until I got breasts and learned how to drive. I tried push up padded bras with disastrous results. Not even a double A fit, and I had an awkward space between the padding and my chest. Practically cavernous. My first boyfriend left me for the girl with the biggest boobs in school. That didn't help. One partner told me there was a huge fetish market for boobs like mine. Was that supposed to make me feel better? Ugh, I have the worst back problems. It must be great to not have to deal with these. You're so lucky, you can wear whatever you want. Women with large breasts sometimes say they're jealous. I guess so. These days, I really like my small boobs. Certified member of Itty Bitty Too. <laughs> Coming out. I knew I liked girls over boys when I was five. In that way you know things for sure when you're five. Mommy, I'm going to get married I'm not going to get married. I'm gonna run away with Audra from across the street and no more dresses, okay? Oh, really? But then I got confused, convinced I was wrong. I forgot what knowing things for sure felt like. Mom, I think Mary Kay is a lesbian, letter to my third grade best friend. Shut up! 
I am not. Give me that. What's a lesbian? <laughs> so I tried to make my gay go away. Senior prom, 1985. Mom was so proud. Of course, that never works. Who we are is always with us. Hey, what do you think of these shorts? College boyfriend. Over there. Side <laughs> I think you should stop, stop shopping in the boys' department. Then, I kissed a girl again at 25. It took 20 years to realize what I knew at five was my truth. I memorized that feeling so I'd never be talked out of it again. Not just about being gay, but about anything. 10 years! Mom is so proud. When I make love, I take my whole life in my hands, the damage and the pride, the bad memories and the good, all that I am or might be, and I do indeed love myself, can indeed do anything I damn please. I know the place where courage and desire come together, where pride and joy push lust through the bloodstream, right to the heart. I took my sex back, my body. I claimed myself and remade my life. Only when I knew I belonged to myself completely did I become capable of giving myself to another, of finding joy and desire, pleasure and love, power in this body no one else owns. Dorothy Anson. Aw, oh, screw it. Why not just date myself already? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the last comic we have to show. But we want to open it up to discussion and questions, and um, we would love to hear from you. And so. If anyone has questions, please feel free to ask. Um, we are also selling books outside through the Odyssey Bookstore. textbook, but we are looking into um, freshman experience, the first year experience possibilities for uh, distributing a book for incoming freshmen to colleges. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of getting a contract and how the publishers go about publishing such explicit to Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wrote a book proposal last winter and was looking for something that was um, a publisher that would both be interested and have experience in some graphic novel or comics, comics publishing, along with uh, a publisher that also maybe dealt with things that weren't necessarily just comics. Um, so Soft Skull Press um, agreed to publish it, and they have um, they had previously published a collection of comics by women of color and queer women, and so it seemed like a good fit since they also have fiction and nonfiction. Um, but as we put the book together, um, we went through and did a lot of editing, sort of mostly of things that were maybe too sloppy to read, um, kind of chose comics that we felt would best serve each chapter. And um, we didn't run into too many major roadblocks. Um, one thing that's interesting that I didn't know is that um, any actual depiction of ejaculation is porn <laughs> rather than education or erotica mm. or something like that. So that influences distribution and that it also influenced certain comics that we would have had to do major changes of or take out entire pages of and that was something complicated and kind of ironic that we didn't realize going into this process. Page 62 all over again. Oh, no. All over again. Exactly. Very sad. So. So there were, there were strips that you decided not to include because like well, yeah, we couldn't include them, um, not through the, actually the publishers were not the ones who had the problem with it, it's um, printers. So 
that's another part of this that's interesting is that even if a publisher thinks it's great and is okay with it and approved it, um, the printers a lot of time are nervous about distribution things or maybe even just more conservative than the publishing companies. So. And it also seemed with that classification, no matter what, even if the printer had decided to print it, and they could have, it just would have cost more, um, then with that classification, it, can only, it limits the distribution. Uh, so it wouldn't have been able to be as widely used or accessible. Yeah. Um, as a sex educator, I'm so excited to see at least some of the book, and so happy that you two have done this. So thank you, first of all. Thank you. Um, you're really expanding our realm and expanding our ability to teach in fun ways and exciting ways. And I loved one of the quotes that you gave us about, he never asked if it felt good, he only asked if it hurt. And so even just bringing the word pleasure mm -hmm. up is mm -hmm. such a revolutionary act. So I want to ask, do you see yourselves as sex educators, and what's next? What's your next book? I think yes. I think definitely I, I see myself as a sex educator, uh, and hopefully can go forward in that role in different ways. We're right now working with a possible collaboration with a, a youth-serving organization based in D.C., but that serves a wide range of the country and also internationally, and hoping to build projects with them that really engage youth as the creators of the comics. Um, so hopefully that will go forward in that venue, which is the most exciting part right now. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're especially interested in working with them because um, they have some peer-to-peer -peer education structures set up that are um, youth directed and have um, a couple different groups, for example, a group that focuses mostly on Spanish speaking youth or um, a group that's just youth, young women of color. And so the opportunity to um, help them design comic activities and drawing activities and um, create their own collections that are similar is exciting to us. Is that advocates for you? Yeah, it's advocates. They're great. I know. Yeah. <laughs> a little starstruck at our meeting with them, but very exciting. Well, that's fantastic. Anybody else? Yes. I guess I have a question about the medium itself. And I know you started out inviting people to contribute material in zine form. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, you developed a website. And so some of your work became digital. It was, I think, maybe more widely distributed. Yeah. And now you have a print book. And I'm just sort of wondering, how does that, um, because we're inundated with sexual images all the time. And there's, you know, you, you mentioned the distinction to pornography, which is interesting to me that sort of certain acts are considered pornography mm -hmm. and or certain medium. Our media are considered pornography. So if I go to a museum and okay. see a sexual act in a you know, 15th century painting, that's supposedly not pornography. But if someone takes a photograph, then it's consensual and it's shown very often. Sometimes there's censorship that still happens today. Yeah. So I'm sort of wondering about what you think, why are certain images um, easier to take for some people in one form how do you, where do you situate yourself in terms of, of um, you know, on this continuum of who decides, and uh, you know, I think there's, a, as you know, debate in, about what is pornography, right. the harm, and what is law, what is not. So I'm just wondering where you yeah. situate. There's a I couple think, of questions. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that a um, few things are happening with that um, in relation to our project. One is um, that it seems to be, um, with the question of the pornographic classification, it seems to be much more squeamish and taboo um, for mainstream culture to um, hear stories of young gay men. And we were sort of, you know, aware of that as an undercurrent of something that happened that made sort of an absence in the book of, of a lot of those prominent stories. Um, and I think that 
that is that's kind of one side to it that there's um, that those are taboo and um, that that comes into play when um, any images like that occur. Um, the other thing though is that I think that within comics themselves um, there's such a history of over sexualized imagery in comics and um, kind of dream girls in comics um, and really uh, sexually explicit things that maybe aren't necessarily healthy <laughs> within that world and so within comics there's also this kind of um, you know acts of resistance in terms of drawing style and in depiction um, just that you know some of, there's also been an underground feminist movement of comics since the 70s that is sort of um, with the drawing styles and with how the stories are depicted and told has gone up against that and I think we saw that really clearly um, we went to SPX which is a small press expo a kind of a comics expo in Maryland this past week and um, you know there's more and more feminist and queer comics emerging but then there's also traditional really gross <laughs> and a lot of times really dumb <laughs> comics out there and um, no so <laughs> yeah one one thing though that's exciting about the comic medium is that it opens up um, a type of visual um, exchange that is self-determined by whoever's the drawing, the, the artist drawing it. And we set, see that as exciting because it affords the ability to depict oneself um, any way that, that you like and um, kind of brings in the imagination and the realm of possibility to something that is constantly trying to be delineated and boxed down. So. Yeah. Now, what do you think about underground comics for our comics class at Hampshire? Would you consider yours an underground or an independent work? Hmm. I don't think it can be, can it be underground now that it's published. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much underground <laughs> stuff published. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah it's we have a very underground yeah. history and roots. We were self-published on the fly and <laughs> the dead of night <laughs> for five years. So. <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely that history to it, and I think the the themes and the narratives that are pervasive throughout the, the anthology of different, over 50 different artists and contributors are very much in the underground scene and very, a lot of times in the punk underground scene, so I think it has a lot of those tones. But then hopefully with the book we can also reach the mainstream world as well. Another um, part of that is that almost no one in the book is a professional comics artist. Right. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were making their first comic ever drawn um, for this and so some people like to draw or draw comics on their own but um, we thought it was exciting that the people's stories in the book aren't necessarily famous comics artists yeah. or people who even draw usually. So. Well thank you all so thank much for you. coming and feel free to stick around and there's snacks and yeah, I'd like to you know, <laughs> welcome you to stay, and, and I'm sure you'd be willing to answer more questions, yes. and you can buy some books and get them signed. And I look forward to seeing you again soon, um, if not sooner, on October 10th, to hear. Oops, the lights oh, that was, I turned the screen off. Oh, <laughs> it just was lights, white lights. Um, when Anita Roost uh, talks about, in some ways, again, the, the question of production and, and technology, so it's, it's somewhat related in some way. Okay. And tomorrow is our reception, and if you want real food, come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.